um, a monster's note centered around the unnamed monster in Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. But in my book, uh, Mary Shelley didn't invent the monster. She met him when she was a little girl of eight years old, sitting by her mother's grave. They became friends. He sat behind the bushes and read her things. When uh, the monster says you in this, um, sometimes he's referring to Victor Frankenstein, who's the man who, who made him, really made him, and then ran away from him. He, the monster opened his yellow, watery eyes in Shelley's book. Victor looked into those eyes and ran away. You know, like he would leave a little baby. It was really terrible. So I felt for this monster. At one point, Mary, as she's dying, wonders about the monster. What's going to happen to him if he can't die? He won't have me caring about him anymore. He'll be really lonely. And in fact, he is. There he is, living on in the East Village. Uh, he made it to New York. Um, he's still alive. Well, that's why, I mean, it was fun for me because then he could, as you saw, he could go to Google. You know, he could look things up. And when he could look things up, I could look things up. And we had a great time. I mean, we learned about all sorts of things. One of the reasons I wanted to uh, break from poems in the way that we normally think of them for years is I, I thought, well, research is fun. And if I'm having fun, I have a feeling my reader will have fun too. I mean, there is nothing more beautiful or, frankly, radical than a fact. A reality is incredibly bizarre. You don't have to like look inside yourself and say, let me make something up. Just look out in the world. It is completely peculiar. And so, and so I started finding quotes, say, on space, because I thought the monster would be interested in that. Once again, these human beings, they made him, they ran away from him, but they'll go to space. And I found all these quotes that struck me about the Earth being so fragile. That interested me. Or the astronauts that didn't want to come back. And so in a way, in my book, I get to be a student. Publishers need to classify things. So they did decide to print the book, and then there was this big discussion. Should we print it as poetry or a, a fiction? Is it a novel? Some of the, uh, this book got huge reviews all over the place. It was really funny. It's, it's not the easiest book, but it got reviewed everywhere. And a lot of the, new, like the Washington Post, the New York Times, the New Yorker, and some of these places would call it a novel, and I, I think, but it's not a novel. I didn't want to write a novel. It's, it's a fiction. Um, and I, I guess I like the hybrid idea because I think in, in life the idea of categories can be corrosive in lots of ways. And it's very exciting when you don't set, down, set out to break something down on purpose, but it just happens. It's true, with the Library of Congress you, you have to say poetry, fiction, and in the end, the publisher did it as fiction because they thought it would sell a lot more copies, really is what it, it boiled down to. But then I have mixed feelings about that. You take a work like Michael Andache's The Collected Work of Billy the Kid, which he first published as a book of poems. Then he became a successful novelist, and the book is now desc described and sold as fiction. So if things get adventuresome in poetry and you keep on taking away from the category of poetry, that's a kind of impoverishment. But this whole idea of broadening out the categories in any area of life, art, music, um, I think it's exciting. And in the age of the web, I'm very curious to see what's going to happen to literature because there's so much out there. And it's true, what we have to do is give it a form. You, ha you have to have focused questions, you have to have a trained mind, a disciplined mind, but then when you find things, boy, can you get excited. Yeah.